Good evening, and um, thanks for the introduction, and um, thank you for being here. I realize it's quite late. Um, and it's also, honestly, it's a little bit late to have a lesson in fundamental physics. So I thought I'm going to tell you one of my favorite scientific stories. And then I'm going to connect it very briefly to the work I'm doing today on dark matter. And just so, I, because I'll probably use the word very loosely later on, let me just remind you that dark matter is a significant fraction of the matter in the universe. In fact, it's 85% of the matter. It's 25% of the energy and 85% of the matter. And it's matter that interacts uh, with gravity like ordinary matter, but as far as we know, it doesn't interact with light. But now I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to tell you this is really, it's really an amazing story. And it actually, for those of you who stayed from the last session, I think it connects very nicely to some of the issues that were raised then. So let me just um, start very briefly, since I have that slide up there. Um, this is based on my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, and it's one chapter that I'm going to refocus on. And it's a chapter about how dinosaurs went extinct, but more importantly, how scientists working together from very different fields uh, figured it out. And I really do think it's one of the most beautiful scientific stories. It's chemists, biologists, geologists, paleontologists, physicists working together to, to figure this out. And I'll give you a flavor of how they did that. And um, just for those, the German speakers there, I'm very happy it's been translated into German. And I just want to know that this book is as much about, um, for me, this book was very much, of course, it's outlined by my theory that I'm going to tell you about. But really, it was an excuse to talk about the entire kind of history of the universe, how we got here, cosmology, um, the galaxy, the solar system, life, and extinctions, but also to contextualize it for the concern for the planet and its history, which I think we heard a lot about in the last session. So let me tell you the story of this extinctions that we actually know was generated by a meteoroid. It's not that one. That's a crater that's in Arizona. And actually, the story of just finding out that there have been extinctions and also the idea that things actually hit the Earth, whether or not they caused extinctions, are both tremendously exciting stories. I mean, people didn't even know about extinctions at all until the late 18th century. I mean, that's pretty recent. I mean, after all, the geological record is somewhat sparse, and things today look like things that used to exist. And the idea that there really are species that just left and left no descendants was quite a remarkable thing, as was the idea that stuff actually hits the Earth from space. I mean, that is also quite a radical concept. Um, after all, it's, it's actually quite funny, because the people who saw things coming from space were basically farmers or people working in the field. And the scientific community actually dismissed them. I mean, after all, they had a lot of crazy theories, too. But then, eventually, one of these objects fell right in front of the Academy of Sciences in Siena, at which point they kind of couldn't deny it. And this one here is one in Arizona. And actually, the story of how that one was identified as being a crater from an impact and not from a volcano was actually interesting. It's coincidentally very near a lot of volcanic activity. So that's a great story in itself. But I don't have time to tell you all of them. There's too many really good stories. So I'm going to focus on the, the story of how we found out that an impact was connected to the last extinction, the ex which was 66 million years ago in which the dinosaurs and probably three quarters of the other species on the planet went extinct. So this is just to remind you, for those who don't know, that basically we have a pretty good record of what happened in roughly speaking the last 550 million years. And that's when they could form fossils, hard, hard fossils. I mean, there are some evidence before that, but this is when we get a pretty good record. And although the likelihood that any individual is going to survive is very small. There was a lot of life on the planet. And there was enough that people were able to figure out that there have been five major mass extinctions. And there's a very loose definition of mass extinction, but you know, over half, two thirds of the species on the planet went extinct. That is a major resetting of the conditions of life. Um, those of you who are following all the recent news, of course, know that we might be undergoing a sixth extinction now, and that's another story. But it's one of the reasons we might want to be studying these extinctions of the past. And um, the one that I'm going to tell you about probably isn't rel as relevant, um, but there was one where, um, where carbon actually played a big role. This one, however, 
is very likely connected to, in fact, it is connected to a meteoroid, a giant rock that hit. So let me tell you about that. And this last extinction is no, used to be known as the KT extinction. It's now known as the KPG extinction for arbitrary reasons that uh, they got rid of tertiary, although they kept quaternary. Um, but the K for the German speakers is Kreida, uh, chalk. I probably am pronouncing it wrong. But it has to do with the fact that the, really this extinction left a very notable visible consequence. Namely, if you go and look at this, this KT boundary layer, it's, it's amazing. Because what you see are very, is very white rock, then a very thin layer of red rock, and then a layer of gray rock. So you look in limestone, and that's what you see. And that's because there was a lot of life that left fossils, basically, that formed that white rock. Then that red layer I'm going to tell you about, it's, going to, it's basically what was the clue to how this extinction happened. And then the gray rock above is an indication that a lot of the life that was there is gone. So of course, for a long time, people wondered what caused this. And one of the clues, and I'm just showing you because I was excited, I got to see this in Spain and in Denmark. I'm not the one who figured this out by all means. Um, it was actually, um, the Alvarezes were the key people, and it was around 1980. And so Walter Alvarez, had, he was interested in timing, like how we could understand how long things took. So his idea, which was a good one, was to say how long did it take for this extinction to happen? So that boundary layer was the clue to how long it took. And why do we care about how long it took? Well, was it something sudden, such as an impact, or was it something relatively slow, like carbon in the atmosphere or volcanic activity? which could be rather rapid, but still is relatively slow. So he wanted to figure out how long it took. Now his father was Luis Alvarez, and he was a physicist. Not only that, he was a nuclear physicist, which is not irrelevant to what I'm going to tell you about later. But he had a really brilliant idea. He said there are elements on Earth, heavy elements, that don't occur naturally on the surface of the Earth, because they descend to the center. Um, so most heavy elements go to the center or at least to the mantle of the core. So iridium is one of those elements. Okay. So his idea was to measure the amount of iridium in this layer and use that as a cosmic hourglass. Now, why is that? That's because, believe it or not, about 60 million tons of meteoritic material are, are descending on Earth, basically all the time, every day. And so in that material, there would be iridium. And so if you found iridium in this layer, it's something that can tell you how long it took because it's descending at a constant rate, was the idea. So it's basically a cosmic hourglass to figure out how long that took, okay? What did they find? They went and measured this layer and they found 30 times the amount of iridium they expected. Then they went back and found it was actually 90 times. And it wasn't just in Italy, which is where um, Walter Alvarez and his wife had gone um, to look around. It was all over the globe. It was in Spain and Denmark, like I said. It was in New, New, New Zealand. It was in the Americas. It was everywhere. So all over the globe, there was this enormous amount of iridium. So where did it come from? Well, Walter Alvarez said it had to have come from space. There's no way that you would find this much on the surface of the Earth. Um, now, that's an interesting idea. It really, the geologists didn't like it so much. The physicists kind of liked the idea. But geologists were not that happy with it. So how are you going to convince people this was true? How are you going to convince people this is really what happened? Well, one of the things you could do is you could look nearby. And one thing that's really interesting is you see, and this is where the, the being a nuclear physicist comes into play, you see all sorts of effects on the rocks that have to do with either being very high pressure or very high temperature. Um, so that's such as um, shocked quartz or spinels, things that look like melted glass. There was lots of evidence that there was something, there was an impact. And why do I say it's connected with nuclear physics? Well, it turns out that the only things that can cause this would either be a nuclear impact or an impact from space, a nuclear bomb or an impact from space. So the fact that they were studying the effects of nuclear bombs at the time actually gave a lot of clues as to what the effects of an impact would be. 
And uh, um, this slide, I should have mentioned earlier, it's just not only did I get to see this, but it turns out to be like one of the most beautiful places around. And a lot of these places, because they are beautiful limestone cliffs, are really gorgeous. But I'm, I'm, that's premature, so I'm gonna go back to here. Okay, so basically, he studied the Scaliarosa. He found this elevated level of iridium. He hypothesized that it came from an impact, and there was lots of evidence nearby that it was associated with an impact. People still were not convinced. Now, it's not a bad thing in science when people aren't convinced, because it really makes you up your game and think about what's really going on. And in this case, they had the question, how can we convince people that it was this impact that actually caused the extinction? So, well, what would be the best way to do it? Well, of course, the best thing you could do would be to actually find the crater, find the impact that caused this, find, find the impact. But if you just think about it for a moment, you realize the odds aren't all that great that you're gonna find it. For one thing, most of the stuff that comes to the Earth falls in the ocean, because after all, most of the Earth is covered with oceans. Not to mention the fact that things could get lost, etc. Plus, they had this problem that actually the iridium was all over the globe, so they didn't even know where to look. But they did have some clues. One of the clues was they knew how much iridium there was, which so Walter could, and others could figure out that it was probably something 10 to 15 kilometers big, coming in at around at least 20 to 30 kilometers per second, okay, per second. So this is something, roughly speaking, I just looked it up, it's roughly speaking about two-thirds the size of Munich, okay, hitting the Earth, traveling at about 30 kilometers a second. So that's, that's enough to cause major damage. Um, so it's not crazy to think that could cause an extinction. However, how are you going to find it? You don't know where to look, and you don't even know if you're going to find it. They, and it this is actually an even better part of the story. So, these, so the geologists went out and looked. They looked at the craters. They actually were very lucky, because it turns out it landed in a continental shelf, and it caused a tidal wave. So they could actually see. So although the iridium was everywhere, they could see evidence of a tidal wave, which told them, roughly speaking, where they should look. So they knew to look somewhere around the Atlantic somewhere near there. But they still didn't know, there's still no one could find the crater. They looked up all the possible candidates. They were either the wrong size or they happened at the wrong time. Meanwhile, Pemex, which is a Mexican oil company, had been doing surveillance for oil. So they had aerial, um, they were looking at gravity, they were looking at magnetic effects, and they were just, they were just looking for oil, and they didn't find it. What they did find, however, the geologists found a circular structure under the water that was buried under the water. And the geologists actually thought it could be associated with something like this. But it was proprietary information. Um, eventually, one of the geologists um, was allowed, um, Penfeld was allowed to present his results at a scientific conference, which um, Coincidentally, it was around 1981. Walter Alvarez had made his theory in 1980. But they weren't talking to each other. Um, however, and for the science reporters in the audience, they should be very excited about this, it was actually a science reporter who had been at the conference that eventually, it was Carlos Byers, who worked for the Houston Chronicle, who eventually told the geologist, you know, I think the kind of thing you're looking for was actually identified by this oil company. And Fortunately, they had some samples. Actually, it's very exciting. They've gone back and dug for more samples very recently. And basically, they were able to put all this together. And, and once you had the crater, it meant you could measure when the impact happened. And you could ask the question, did the impact happen at the same time as the extinction? And at this point, we know that these things happened within a few, about 30,000 years of each other, which is an amazingly precise thing for something that happened 66 million years ago. So there is no doubt that they are connected. Now, what we don't know for sure is how stuff died, but there was plenty of opportunity for things to die. I like to joke that it's basically every disaster scenario from any movie you've seen except for a zombie apocalypse. I mean, there were fires, there were earthquakes, there was global warming, there was global cooling, there was acid rain. Basically, if you, there were fires immediately. So everything that could kill stuff was around. 
So the stuff that survived was basically stuff that could bury or stuff that can fly. So really, when I say the dinosaurs went extinct, it's really the terrestrial dinosaurs that went extinct. As you know, birds are somewhat descended from dinosaurs, and they survived, as did mammals. So indirectly, our very existence is actually attributable to this extinction, because had it not happened, the dinosaurs probably would have continued to dominate the resources on the planet. So that's the story, and I find it an amazing story. So now I'm going to spend the rest of the time giving you a hypothesis for how this might be connected to dark matter. Now, I just want to emphasize, this is science. This is science in progress. It's a hypothesis. We don't know if it's true. But really, the exciting idea is the idea about what dark matter can be, which is something we're really investigating. And I have to say, um, I'm very impressed um, by Germany, because in Germany, people actually understand science. I know this sounds kind of like I don't like to categorize that much. But basically, you know, I explained my theory to the drivers, and they immediately asked, so how can we test this theory? They really understood. So I'm going to tell you, so we can't have a re-extinction of the dinosaurs, but I'm going to tell you the real science behind what we're doing in a, very briefly and, and how we think it can be tested. So again, I told you dark matter is a significant fraction of the matter in the universe. We don't know what it is. We know very little about it. We know it interacts with gravity. We know it doesn't interact with light. We don't know if it's an elementary particle, and we don't know if it's a single elementary particle. And this was basically our starting point. Could there be a fraction of dark matter that was different? Now, why is that interesting? Well, if you look at our galaxy, this is our galaxy, but it's all galaxies. Um, <laughs> galaxies have um, a Milky Way disk, which has ordinary matter, and it's surrounded by dark matter dark matter and what we call a spherical halo. So there's dark matter around it. There's a lot of it. But our matter is in a disk. Have you ever wondered why that's true? Well, I hadn't actually known the answer to this before I started working on it. But you might ask, why would dark matter be in a halo and ordinary matter be in a disk? And the reason is actually rather simple. Ordinary matter interacts with light. Now, why is that important? Because it interacts with light it can cool down by emitting photons. So ordinary matter can cool down, emit photons, and collapse. It collapses into a disk and not a ball because of angular momentum. That part I'm not going to expect you to necessarily understand. But I want you to understand that it collapses because it cools down. So we had a hypothesis that maybe some of the dark matter does the same thing, that it could also cool down because it interacts with its own light. And one of the reasons I like this research project is it shows you how um, anthropocentric we are when we do research. We think our matter is so interesting and has all these complex properties. I mean, we know that for a fact. But we assume dark matter is really simple, that it's one non-interacting thing. But if that's not true, it could have tremendous consequences. And that's one of the things we're investigating. We don't know if it's right, but it has amazing consequences. After all, Ordinary matter is just a small fraction of the matter in the universe, yet it's clearly very relevant. And it's relevant because of all the other interactions that it has. So we suggest maybe dark matter is the same. So in addition to the fact that there's a disk, we assume maybe there's also a dark matter disk, because dark matter could do this. And if it's true, it could be thinner and denser than the rest of it. So I'm, gonna, I'm almost out of time. So I'm going to tie up very quickly, but I'm going to give you the idea of how this could happen, why this could be connected to the story I just told you. So there's this thin dark matter disk inside the Milky Way disk. You probably can't see it, but it's there. And so here's the other thing. The solar system orbits around the galaxy about every 240 million years. But as it does so, it actually bobs up and down through the galactic plane a little bit like horses on a carousel. So it's going around, but it bobs up and down. Every time it goes through that dark matter disk, there will be an extra tidal force from gravity. This dense dark matter disk will give you an extra force. And that extra force can actually dislodge comets at the edge of the solar system, where they are very weakly bound. So every time it goes through, and it might be about every 30, 35 million years, Every time it goes through, it could be that there's an enhanced probability of one of these big rocks hitting the Earth. 
And my collaborator and I actually looked at the record. This is something that's very cool. You can go to the internet and find every impact crater that anyone has ever identified um, that's ever been found, the Earth Impact Database. And we found that there is evidence for a periodicity on this time scale. And notice the last one that happened that we cared about was 66 million years ago. We passed through about 2 million years ago. It's completely consistent with this idea. Um, will we know about it? Well, we're not going to have dinosaurs go extinct again. But if there is a dark matter disk, it has many effects. One of the most obvious is that it affects the motion of stars as they go up and down through the Milky Way plan. And right now, there's a satellite launched by the European Space Agency called the Gaia satellite measuring a billion stars in the Milky Way. It's measuring very accurately their position and velocity. So if there is this dark matter disk, we will know about it. I wish I had more time to tell you about all of this. But I'm just going to say that this is one of the stories, but the other stories that I wanted to get across in the book are just how impressive science is. And like I said, one of the things I like about this particular type of science is how all these different fields work together. The importance of the rate of change, just how things happen, how extinctions happen, um, and also how recent is our understanding. So um, I'm so glad that people here are interested in this. I wish I had more time to tell you all the other amazing stories, because there are a lot of amazing stories, and the science going on today is indeed very exciting. So thank you for delaying your dinner and being here, and um, I wish I could answer questions too.